Today is June 28th, 2015. The title of today's message is Social with Sodom. Social with Sodom. Uh, a little caveat to that, maybe the, the alternative uh, title could be What's Love Got to Do with It? Giving you pause to sing the song in your head. Uh, we are living in an incredibly exciting time. Do not be afraid of what's going on around us. This is what we're made for. We are made to shine brightly. The, the darker the night, the design for us is to be the brightest light possible. The world is getting darker. Lines are being drawn clearly in the sand. You know what? I rejoice in that. I'm not afraid of that at all. If, if you just watch the news this week, we've got everything from ISIS celebrating a holy month by planning more and more attacks across the world. <laughs> Our news media can't even figure out, well, we guess it's this, but nobody's taking credit for it. Hey, it's that. Across the world. Paris. Different places. We have our illustrious Supreme Court of the United States that made a decision. Nine lawyers made a decision. In a five to four vote, they decided to redefine marriage. They decided to say that it was okay to have in every state, now by the way, 36 out of the 50 states had already agreed with this. 36 out of the 50. We happened to be in a state that had a constitution and laws that said opposite, that, that were more in keeping and aligned with the Bible. But 36 out of the 50 almost three-quarters of the people, and the states rather, had already decided that this was okay. So in an unprecedented turn, the Supreme Court ruled on a very moral matter, matter and decided to make law, <laughs> decided to change the course of history. Friday, in case you missed it, history was changed on Friday. And you and I are here for such a time as this. Amen. This is exactly what we are supposed to be about. Um, the pastors got together this morning, Pastor Matt, Pastor Eric, and I got together this morning, and we said this is too important of a topic not to address. We're not typically a topic-driven church. We're trying to pray, we try to hear from the Lord, and give exactly what the Lord is directing. To not address this seems to be ridiculous. So we're going to talk about being social with Sodom, and I'm going to explain all of this in just a second. Part of what I hope that you get today is this that you get a clear scriptural understanding, obviously. But I want to put something in your hand today. I want to equip, equip you to be able to go out and talk to the people that are around you. Statistics say that somewhere between 2 to 3% of the United States population are actually homosexual. 2 to 3%. If you include people in our teens and 20-something who have experimented either on college campuses or high school parties or whatever it may be, then you get a much larger percentage than that, maybe 25% according to some. Now, who've, how can people determine this? I'm not always quite sure. Maybe 25%, so one in four, that have dabbled into something which causes them to kind of align with this type of thinking. Right? Right? If you've got a weakness, don't you tend to be more sympathetic to those with the same type of weakness? Well, maybe they're much worse than you, but we tend to want to excuse their sin, the extreme why, because it makes us feel better about our sin. So this is what is going on just in our country, and I'm not going to spend all day talking about statistics, Hala, easy for me to say, right? Statistics. We're going to get in the Word and see what God has to say, but we want to be very, very clear on what's being addressed today. We want to be very clear. We are the light of the world. Yeah. We are the salt of the earth. Yeah. It is our job to be a catalyst everywhere we go. Everywhere we go, we are supposed to be a catalyst, a standard of righteousness that does not move regardless of what the world around us is doing. There's a lot of things that I think that may come from this ruling that took place on Friday, but we're going to get into the word here. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 18. I hope you're ready. I hope you have your notebooks out. I hope you have your pens ready. 
You're going to hear from Pastor Eric later on. You've heard from Pastor Matt. We are unified in this as a church. We are unified in what we're talking about today. Amen? Amen. Social with Sodom. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 18, and we're going to start off in verse 16. Say there when you're there. Now today, a, a little bit that's going to be different is we have some slides here. It's only going to have certain scriptures. I know we get used to having all of the scriptures up on the screen, but we're going to ask you to do that today for the most part. And the, the scriptures on the screen are the ones that we're going to focus on, okay? Give you a little cheater. You're already going to know what's coming up. Chapter 18, verse 16 says this, When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. These were three angels that had appeared. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? We serve a God who is so incredible that He will not hide His will from His people. Amen. He will speak through the prophets. He will speak through the righteous people and He will tell them what He's about to do. And this is an example of that. Verse 18, Abram, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on the earth will be blessed through him. Verse 19, for I have chosen him so that he may direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised. The reason is you see on the screen that Abraham was chosen. If you come on our Monday nights to foundation, this is not brand new to you. You've heard this. We've talked about this multiple times. But for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household. Uh, let me encourage you. It's not, enough, <laughs> it's not enough for me to only worry about my walk with the Lord. I've got an incredible wife. I've got incredible kids. And it's not enough for me to just think about this in terms of myself only. It's about God chooses us based on if we will direct our own household. If we will direct our own children and our household after us to keep the way of the Lord. This is the framework. This is why Abraham was chosen. Father Abraham, a man of faith, the reason he was chosen was because of the integrity of his own home, the integrity of his own walk as demonstrated in his family. Look down in verse 23. After these angels had talked to Abraham, they immediately turned their direction towards Sodom and it says this, Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people? <laughs> this question here, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What a pivotal question for all of Christianity. God, what are you going to do? I have friends who are either fretting over the uh, constitutional, I'm, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court that made their ruling on same-sex marriage. I have people that are fretting. And I have other people who are going, look, look, this is no big deal. Look, that happened on Friday. See, the world is still spinning. Nothing caught on fire yet. It's just fine. Let's just kind of just move on. It just is what it is. There's both sides of this. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? God, can you handle this? Is Abraham's question. How are you going to handle this? Because there are some bad people out there. What are you going to do? And then the next part of this chapter is what? It's, it's, it's Abraham. He's kind of bargaining with God. So um, if you find 50, 50 people, it's a whole city. So let's just say you find 50. God, will you destroy them if you find 50 righteous? And God says, no. I won't destroy the entire city if a small, small minority of people are righteous. I will not destroy them. Did they deserve to be destroyed? Well, we know the outcome of the story. We know that they did. But Abraham is saying, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? How, God, how are you going to do this? It's troubling to my soul. We see so much sin. How are you going to handle this? Are we doomed for destruction in the process of this? Abraham continues on with this bargaining with God. Well, I know I've said 50. Lord, and you were so gracious that you said you wouldn't destroy him for 50. Look, what about 45? Right? We know the story. This is exactly what it... Well, I mean, you wouldn't destroy the city for... I mean, a difference of five people, would you, Lord? He says, no. I wouldn't destroy him for that. I'll, 45 is the new 
is the new uh, standard. <laughs> what he's looking for, just give me 45 righteous people. Uh, beg your pardon, Lord. What about 40? 30? 20? 10? He bargains with God, and the truth is, is he not, he's not bargaining with God, is he? He's getting clarity on God's heart in the matter. Yes. There is a righteous standard that's there, and he's saying, God, will you destroy it if there are righteous people there? No. I won't sweep away the righteous with the wicked. Turn to, uh, I'm going to, um, you can leave the screen right there. I'm going to turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. You guys in your Bibles, you can turn with me there. 2 Peter chapter 2, and starting in verse 4. We'll come right back to Genesis here in just a moment. You guys there? there? Okay, sorry. Must have put you to sleep there real quick. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if we did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, isn't this the question that Abraham asked? He's reminding them, he didn't spare the angels, he didn't spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds of what he saw and heard. Verse 9, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. I'm going to read that last verse again to you. A um, year and a half, two years ago, I guess, I came and spoke and did uh, part of the message was about both and. Okay, this is a both and for you. If you, ha if you weren't there, it's just showing instead of an either or process, God most of the time is both and. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. He can do both. This mighty God will hold the righteous standard and he will save us in the process. What you're hearing, and we're going to get to this a little bit more later on, but what you're hearing, the rhetoric, the arguments for what's going on right now is, huh, um, I've seen this a lot the last few days. Hashtag, love wins. Uh, the hashtag, social media, you can kind of start a conversation and people can kind of follow what's going on through the hashtag. You know, pull all those people who wrote that same hashtag and you can see what everybody's saying about it. Supreme Court makes their ruling and people start going, love wins, love won today. Oh, love won. It's a love, all right. It's not a godly love. Well, how can you be so judgmental? We're going to go over scripture because we have to be equipped, ladies and gentlemen. I know we are in a room of basically like-minded people, but I can't presume that everyone here, first of all, agrees with what the Scripture has to say about it. Perhaps you've been deceived into thinking that it is only about love. And God really is so much about love that He's okay with this. I mean, right? Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? The reason I love the times that we're in is because it's going to make us stand more clearly for what righteousness is. Amen. I have pastor friends, the very first thing they put, this happens and they go, great, love wins, I'll do your wedding. It, it broke my heart. People who should know the word, who know the word just as well as I do. And they've been so corrupted in their thinking to think that it's okay. Brother, all we, we just need to love, we just need to let love win. I serve a God who will deal with the wicked, and I do not want to be counted amongst that. In Jesus' name and by His power, I will not be accounted according to that. We're going to talk about how to have conversations with the homosexuals today. 
We're going to talk about what the Bible has to say, and you're going to find out that God is a God of love, but it's not the way that we're trying to define it through hashtags and social media. There actually is a plan that encompasses the entire Bible from beginning to end, from page one to the end, and it shows us the plan of what we are supposed to do. Even if every person in this room is completely like-minded, we have to go out and be light. We have to go out and be salt. To think that you're not going to encounter people this week who are going to have their Love Wins t-shirts on or whatever it is. I have a burden in my soul for our congregation today. I have a burden in my soul for my country. I have a burden. And at the same time, I'm excited. Amen. If you'll turn back to Genesis chapter 18. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? The next slide says this. Um, what we're not going to actually do is today is spend a great deal of time on the next slide. I'm going to call it the blatantly obvious. Right? Um, we, can, we can put up tons of scriptures, and you know that in, in, our, in our church, we've been trained. <laughs> if you want to say that the whole Bible said something, what do you do? You see Jesus, you see Paul, they, from the law, the prophets, the writing, and in our case, we would add New Testament scriptures. And within three or four scriptures, as representative of others, we can say, hey, look, the whole Bible concludes this. This is how they would do in Hebrew times. This is how we've been taught to do here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a few scriptures there because they're not all up there. Leviticus 18.22 talks about how sexual immorality, specifically homosexuality, is an, one of the older translations says an abomination. An abomination. Uh, that's not a, oops, you messed up. That is an abomination to the God of all creation. Okay? Uh, and you see the different ones there. Romans is a New Testament one. <laughs> They've been perverted in their thinking. They've given themselves over to these evil thoughts. Right? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. We're going to go over that. Um, I have another uh, one that I'd like to add to that. It's out of Psalms, chapter 101. I'm going to turn to it and read it to you really quickly. Psalms 101. <clears throat> And verse 4, Men of perverse heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. I will have nothing to do with an abomination, is what the Lord says. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 4, <laughs> Eric and I found this one right before service. Listen to this. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 4. Listen to this. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Habakkuk 1.4 Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. If we put our hope in a system, uh, let me encourage you, my, I have zero hope that, that anything will overturn the ruling that just took place on Friday. If it does, well, praise God. It would take a revival across America to change the hearts of people before that law would ever get changed. I pray for that. I have, that is not even, my hope is not in whether the law gets overturned or not. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Wow. Almost like Habakkuk knew exactly what we might be facing today. Now back to Genesis. <laughs> Actually, it says here in Jude, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. By the way, um, some of this argument that we're having, <laughs> they will try to be deceptive and say, hey, look, really the Bible is just about monogamy. This is just about, it's just about love. It's just about a relationship. Um, God says here, uh, and what they also say is sometimes in Sodom and Gomorrah it was about this violence, about this, these improper acts. It wasn't, that's not about love. That's not what is really going on here. The Bible says that the issue with Sodom and Gomorrah that caused their destruction was not anything else other than giving themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. Lest we forget that, that is exactly the reason that we're going to read this story here. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Wow. In Genesis 
chapter 19. Let's look at that. Susan, you can go ahead and put this passage of Scripture up. Uh, Yeah. We'll start in verse 4. Genesis 19 and verse 4. It says this, Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Two angels had arrived. Lot was sitting at the city gate. He invited them to come in. They said, no, we'll just stay in the town square, which is a very normal thing to do. Ah, We'll just sleep out on the corner. It's no big deal. We'll just sleep out here. Lot said, no, 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 no. Come on in. Let Let me host you. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Uh, pretty bold, isn't it? Pretty bold. pretty bold. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind them and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them, but don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Um, um, Gross. What kind of man would offer his daughter, daughters, virgin daughters? Could it be that Lot was trying to handle immorality with something that was slightly less offensive? Well, at least you'll... Pardon pardon the language here. At least you'll gang rape a female instead of a male? That's the alternative that was proposed. We will never defeat immorality by doing and suggesting something less offensive that is also immoral. You don't overcome darkness with slightly less darkness. You overcome darkness with light. You overcome unrighteousness with righteousness. You un- overcome unholiness with a pure standard of what is holy. Amen. This, although he thought it would be something better, <laughs> this is embarrassing. This is a terrible idea. And yet, this is where we are. This is, well, uh, we cannot have a standard that moves based on the people that were there. We cannot say, hey, homosexuality, well, at least you're monogamous? Really? So we're going to do a lesser evil to try to cover up the evil. Guys, this is not going to work this way. Think about this scripture. He offered two virgin daughters to the slime of the earth. Verse 9, get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as an alien and now he wants to play judge? So they start bad-mouthing Lot, right? <laughs> Who do you think you are to try to hold a righteous standard? And by the way, right, we've just explained that wasn't particularly even a righteous standard. And still look at their re- rebuttal. We, we'll treat you worse than them. Uh, really? <laughs> you think what we're going to do to those two guys is bad? You wait to see what we do to you. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Um, And I realize this is being recorded and this is going to be on the internet and I'm completely fine with that. Hi, my name is Wade Sutherland. I'll give you my address if you need it. Here we are. I learned when I went to college. Uh, I went and studied music. And so in my section of the campus at my university, public university, about 30,000 students. I know there are some that are larger, but that was about the size of the school when I was there. And my school of music slash dramatic performance people, we had a very high concentration of homosexuals. It's almost as if they all flocked to our little section of campus. Okay? What I found out was that it was uh, the spirit behind homosexuality is very, very, very aggressive. Um, this idea of tolerance, well, we just want tolerance. No, you don't. If by tolerance you mean 
that you don't want me to impose anything on you, but you want to impose your thoughts on everyone else on the whole planet. That is the definition of tolerance. When we hear that word, that's what they mean. You don't tell me that I'm wrong, but I'm going to impose upon you things that you don't like. But don't impose anything that I don't like. When I was at LSU, there were groups of homosexuals that would literally find and target people. I watched it. (laughs) I'm sitting in college trying to start a Bible study in the lobby of the School of Music. Getting together friends. We're praying out loud in the open. There would be these groups of people, and God, for whatever reason, He allowed me to see it and understand what was going on in those moments. They would find the weak. They would find the the guys with daddy issues. They would find all these, and they would literally attack. Now, the attack looked like, (laughs) hey, nobody else really understands you. We, we understand you. Please, come be a part of our group. All you need is love. All you need is acceptance. And they would lure, they would just lure people in. A friend of mine from high school, we went to the same high school. We graduated at the same time. He was my friend. He grew up in a certain denominational church that was very close to there. And they sucked him in. And within about six months, he was completely openly gay. 18 years old. Decides that they're right. Ladies and gentlemen, the, you may look at this and people may take this Sodom and Gomorrah and say it really wasn't about sexual perversion. It was because they were, so, they were so violent and so, oh, it was so vile. That's why we read Jude that says it's about the sexual perversion. Don't let that spirit of aggression cause you to recoil. I've been around somebody so they're so aggressive you don't even know what to say. You're just like, uh, 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 uh. we can't respond that way to this type of spiritual attack. We have to be able to stand firm and just say, no, stop right there. Not going to listen to your lies. This is truth, and you're not speaking it. Amen. We've got to be able to stand up and do this. Um, by the way, my wife and I are talking this weekend, and we're going, are our kids ready to handle this? Have we done a good enough job to speak to our children where they can go, bam, here's Scripture. The truth is, is I don't know yet. I feel like the answer is No. I'm being very, very honest with you. I feel like my job as a parent, I haven't done enough for them yet. Oh, I will. But I want them to be able to go, here's truth, here's scripture, here's love, yes, but it's not the kind of love that you're looking for, and as a matter of fact, you're actually looking for this love and don't even know it. Where we can stand for these things, for for righteousness. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Guys, it's not going to stop at a same-sex marriage being legal. No. It's going to keep pushing. Yeah. It's going to keep pushing for this tolerance, so much tolerance that if we say that it's sin, then we're going to be held liable. They're going to close down our businesses. They may throw us pastors in jail. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Is that all you got? That the, you're going to keep pressuring me and you think I'm going to back down? That's, that's just not how this thing is going to happen. Verse 10, but the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back inside the house and shut the door. Then they struck the house, young and old, with blindness so that they could not find the door. That's that's pretty blind. They were right outside the door, right? Bam! Whoa! They can't eat. You were right there, dude. Like, how is it blindness and dumbness? I guess because they just got stupid, couldn't find the door. Hey, so when God protects you, He protects you. I don't care how close the enemy is encroaching. When he protects you, he protects you. The two men um, said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Interesting, these angels are asking questions. You would, I mean, we can presume that just these things know, that, that people just know these things. <laughs> just questions, hey, so is anyone else here? You better get them in here. You, and you better get out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Verse 14, so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were pledged to marry. So he went out. By the way, where did he go out? The door. The door. They were pledged to be married to his daughters. He said, hurry and get them out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city but his sons-in-law thought he was joking. 
Are you kidding me? <laughs> really? God's going to bring... We're not wicked people. We're not wicked. Um, you're wicked. And God is against you. I actually love you enough that I want to tell you that so that, you do not be, that you're not separated from a holy and a righteous and a loving God. I actually love you enough. I actually love this kingdom enough. I actually love the people of God enough not to let this slide just because I like you. Just because this is another, this is another argument that I've heard a lot. I've heard people change their theology. Listen to me. I've heard people change their theology on this point because they started getting to know homosexual people and realized that there was a struggle there and they were fighting against sin. And so sympathy for people who are walking in sin has caused personal friends of mine to literally turn their back on the gospel. Well, it sounds different when I say turn their back on the gospel besides change their theology, right? They turn their back on the gospel. They walk away from what is true and what is right and what is holy because they feel bad for this person who, goodness knows, they had such a rough story. I'm sorry you had a rough story. Here's the righteous standard. I actually love you enough to really help you, not to just pretend like I'm going to help you. Verse 15. Uh, Susan, you can switch to the other one now. Thank you. With the coming of dawn, the angel urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. We're going to find out some things here in these next few verses that are going to provide a framework for us to understand what we're supposed to do. With the coming of dawn, the angels told Lot, saying, Hurry. When, I, when you look up and you find what that word hurry means, the next slide shows it to us. It's Old Testament number 6965. And it says this. It means a verb meaning to arise. Okay? To stand up. It can designate the following attributes. To show honor and respect. <laughs> Again, the NIV says hurry. When we say the word hurry here, this is all of the other words that could have been chosen. And this is the bigger picture of what the word that was chosen in NIV as hurry. I think I like the word arise better. Arise. Get up. Rise up. Don't just be in a hurry, but rise up and get something about you that starts getting going. To show honor and respect. Perhaps we should show honor and respect for the word of God. Amen. And his ways and his ways only. To move. Yes. Don't just stand still. We're going to do and advance the kingdom. To recover. Yes. To belong. Guys, this is what the whole problem is with this whole agenda. They're trying to say that they want to belong. The belonging is here. To cost. To be valid. Yes. To appear. To follow. Look at this next phrase. To be hostile. I thought God was all about peace. He is who He is from beginning to end. He is all of this. To endure, to replace, to ratify, to obligate, to establish or strengthen, to fulfill, to provide, to rouse, to perform, to revive, to keep one's word, to appoint, come on now, to be victorious. Yes. Arise. If we are supposed to arise, this is what it looks like. We see here the angels say to Lot, arise, get up, man. Wake up, rouse yourself, be victorious in this. Do not let the enemy come in and steal. Do not let the enemy come in and steal your friends anymore. Do not let it tear down homes. Get up. Do something about this. You cannot be passive and accomplish this word. You cannot sit there. We cannot be still and let these things take place around us and think that God is going to be okay with it. You cannot. You have got to take it to the enemy. You have got to arise. Amen. Back to verse 15. With the coming of dawn, the angel said to Lot, they urged Lot, saying, hurry. Or we know that we're going to replace that in our, for today's version, it's going to say arise. Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Again, we mentioned this earlier. It's not enough for me to just get there by myself. I am responsible for my family. You know why? Because I'm supposed to be the child of Father Abraham. And he was chosen because he would raise his children and his household in the ways of the Lord. Amen. 
When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. Everybody say, he was merciful. He was merciful. They hesitated. Exactly what about the situation that you just left makes you want to hesitate and stay where you are? Was it the part where a large group of people tried to attack two men that had come into your home? Oh, was it the part where you offered your two daughters? Was it the part where God's destruction is going to come? Is that what makes you hesitate? How in the world? And yet we're all prone to doing things just like this. If you don't think that you're prone to it, then be careful lest the enemy actually get you and deceive you. We are prone to hesitating when we should arise. Amen? As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop. Everybody say, don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop anywhere in the plane. Um, we are now on a journey whether you want to be on it or not. Whether you want to be on this journey with us, you're on the journey, and so I'm going to tell you, don't stop. Don't stop anywhere in the, in the lowlands here. You can't just stop. Look what it says on the next slide. It says this. The don't stop is this. Don't hesitate. When God is instructing you to do something, when there is sin in your life, don't hesitate to get it corrected. Amen. If it costs you everything you have, if you have to lose your home and your job and your health, just lose it all. Don't hesitate and do what God is calling you to do. There is no other choice. The only other choice is destruction that is approaching. Do not hesitate. Flee for your lives. Understand, folks. Uh, I wrote that one down. Not only does it say it there, but it's got this uh, implication that, hey, this is a matter of life and death. Yes, it is. This, topics that we're, we're approaching, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, ISIS, what's going on in the world around us, these are life and death, life and death issues. We have, to be atten- we have to pay attention. So many Christians are lulled into a sleep. Just, hey man, as long as my house is good, as long as I can get from here to back to work and to church, I'm pretty good. No, we don't stop. We don't hesitate. We flee for our lives because this thing is important. <laughs> if it's difficult for the righteous to get in, um, hopefully that's us. If it's difficult, well then perhaps I don't want to take this lightly. Perhaps I want to run after this with all, my might, with all my heart and with all my might. It says, don't look back. Verse 17, it says, as soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. <laughs> victories or defeats, don't look back. Don't let the victories that you've had lull you into thinking that you'll be okay this next time. Don't let your failures keep you and draw you back and, well but you don't know, don't look back. We're going to look forward. We're going to set our eyes. We're going to set our face like flint towards Jerusalem, towards the things of God, and we're just going to go after it. Amen. And then it says this. It says, don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. On the next slide, I just put, uh, yeah, after that one. I just put this. I called it <laughs> get to high ground. You just got to get up to the high ground, get to the mountains. Let's see what it says here. Turn to Judges chapter 19. There's a very similar event that takes place to Sodom and Gomorrah here. Are y'all with me? Yes. I'm going to presume that some of the silence is just because we're all in agreement here. Judges chapter 19. I'm going to talk you through this story using these key scriptures here. A very similar thing happened, but this time it was in the land of Israel. Not Sodom and Gomorrah. A very, very similar incident happened. Hey, we see that you've got visitors. Why don't you hand them over because we want to have sex with him? Offers either a virgin daughter or a concubine in this case. The men abuse this woman basically to the point of death. Look at verse 30. It says, Everyone who saw it said, Such a thing has never been seen or done. 
Not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Think about it. Consider it. Tell us what to do. This horrible thing that happened so moved them. They were like, look, we understand about Sodom and Gomorrah, but those weren't inside the house of God. Those were, those were different kinds of people. In our land, this has never happened. We've never heard of such a thing. This is the most preposterous thing that has ever happened. What are we going to do about it? It's preposterous. It's crazy. Almost like a Supreme Court and five judges. Five human beings. If you really want to get fancy with this, one human being, one person who would have made a different decision, one American literally changed a definition for marriage for our entire 320 million member country. One. Huh. It goes throughout. They, they rally. They rally an army. They get the army together. In Judges chapter 20, verse 21, it says, the Benjamites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. Um, the preface to that is, the Israelites gathered together an army, a large army. And they said, Lord, do you want us to go attack our brothers? These are our brothers. These are the Benjamites. Do we go and do this? And the Lord said, yes, go do it. Absolutely, go out and do this. And the result is verse 21. They lost 22,000 Israelites on the battle that day. Wow. To put that in context, um, D-Day, World War II, June 6th, 1944? 44. June 6, 1944. On D-Day, in that one day, approximately nine to 10,000 Ameri- um, Allied forces were lost. Let's go on the high end. Let's say it was 10,000. 22,000. God told them to go to battle and they lost 22,000 people. Perhaps the victory isn't always in what we think that it's in. Perhaps there's an obedience factor here that is much more important than what it looks like on the outside. Perhaps if we stop, if they would have stopped after that day, they would have gone, God, you told us, and we lost 22,000. Maybe God doesn't really love us. What happens in the rest of the story? They go back and inquire of the Lord. They're weeping. They're fasting, going, God, do you want us to go back out again tomorrow? I mean, we just lost 22,000 people. Do you want us to go again tomorrow? And God says, yes, go again tomorrow. So they go out again. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin the second day. This time when the Benjamites came out from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000. Day one, 22,000. Day two, 18,000. In two days, 40,000 people. 40,000. You know what they did? They went back to the Lord. They said, Lord, we're fasting, we're praying again. Do you want us to go back out again? The Lord says, yes, for I'm going to give them. Go for tomorrow, I will give them into your hands. And they routed the Benjamites that day. They turned the tide that day. Guys, I can't tell you that I have a good explanation for why they lost 22 and then 18,000 and then he finally let them win the next day. I imagine that it's to part of it, at least, is for us to understand our victory comes in the obedience. When we arise to be victorious, it's us going out and doing what God has told us to do and that He is going to get the glory and make it work out. He's going to make it work out. I can't promise you that you won't, that on day one it's going to work out. <laughs> I can't promise you on day two it's going to work out. But the idea is that we're going to keep fighting and doing exactly what the Lord says. They kept going back to the Lord. They kept purifying their hearts, they kept cleansing their hands, and they went back before the Lord in fasting and prayer and said, we're going to do this. Lord, do you want us to keep going? Yes, I want you to keep going. Lord, do you actually want us to stand up against homosexuality in our day? I mean, you do know that we live in Houston, right? Like, you do know that, right? Yes, I want you to continue to advance again. I want you to go back out and do exactly what I've asked you to do. Turn back to Genesis Chapter 19, and it says this. We can start in verse 17. As soon as they had brought them out, 
One of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Guys, we've got to get up on high ground. We have got to elevate our thinking. We have got to elevate our game. Amen. Have you heard it lately? Have, have you guys been paying attention to what God's doing, not only in your life, but in, the, in our church's life? Doesn't it seem like there's this cry for holiness every time we get together? Yes. Don't get tired of that. Don't look at that and refute what God is doing and you go, well, golly, I mean, aren't we, aren't we there yet? Aren't, I mean, we're all, I mean, we're trying to do this thing. Apparently not. Apparently God is calling us to get up on high ground. And he's saying, come up where I am. Because where I am is where you need to be. But it requires a holiness. You can't just decide if you're good enough. God is going to say, if he's quickening in our heart, if he's giving us words, if the song, if everything that we're doing is saying, be holy, folks. Let's take care of it once amongst ourselves. If we're having some issue against each other, we've got to take care of it. If we're having a personal issue between us and the Lord, we've got to take care of it. He loves us too much to let us just slide by and going, yay, good job. Way to go. He's saying, be holy. Come up on this mountain. Come be where I am. Amen. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 9. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral. Uh, what does that mean? It means he's talking to the church. That's right. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 is talking to the church. I've written you in my letter not to associate. We're going to go into that in just a minute. With sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. <laughs> It's like, oh, that's, and it caught me kind of funny the first time I read it. I was like, well, yeah. If you're going to get away from all these people not to associate. Verse 11, but now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, or an idolater, or a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. Folks, if judgment always begins in the house of God, that's why I think it's very gracious that God is just encouraging us to get holy. And He's calling us. And there are words of encouragement. And there are words of prophecy that say, get holy. What are you doing? Be holy. Well, I'm doing pretty good. I don't care if you're doing pretty good. Be holy. He doesn't say be pretty good. He doesn't say be better than your neighbor. He says be holy. Why? For God says, I am holy. He who called us is holy. Therefore, we are to be holy. This is for the house of God, folks. Amen. Judgment is beginning in the house of God in this passage. And you need to get this. You need to understand the context of this. <laughs> Look at verse 12. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man where? From among you. You know what this means? Let's put this in practical terms. There cannot be a minister who is also homosexual. That's right. um, I realize that there are people with a title of minister who are working in churches and leading churches and overseeing lots of churches who are homosexual. This passage of Scripture very clearly marks and says that cannot be. That's right. That cannot be. People who are struggling and, oh, but they seem so genuine. Um, I, I have some marching orders here, and I may not even like them. But I'm actually going to learn to love it because this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. This will keep me holy. This will keep the church holy. This will keep God's plan on track if I do what He says. 
My feelings have nothing to do with this. And actually, I do love it. I love it. Because it's a clear standard. Let's, let's look at not associate. We see not, not to associate or sexually immoral. For our Bible students here, New Testament in the Greek, 4874. Do not associate. Another ways to say it. Don't get together with. Or to mix together. Or to mingle together. Or to have fellowship with. Or to keep company with. Don't be around these people who are sexually immoral, idolaters, greedy, slanderers. Don't be around them. Don't go out to eat with them. We just read it. It says don't even go eat with them. Wow. Perhaps we serve such a holy God that we are supposed to reflect Him. If we are His children, we do what He does. And He says that there's a line. That's right. You can leave those things behind and come to this side of the line, but you can't, keep, you can't have both. In this case, it is not a both and. You can't keep your own lifestyle and say that you're going to be in the house of God. Another word uh, that's a synonym, means the same thing as 4874, is koinonia. Pure fellowship. Do not have fellowship. Do not in, in, intertwine your heart and your life with people who are sexually immoral. Don't do it. You ready for this? 4205. Take a look at that Greek word. Do not associate with sexually immoral people. The word is pornos. Pornos. Wonder, wonder what English words we get from that. And this word means exactly what you think it might mean. A whoremonger. A fornicator. A male prostitute. The effeminate an impure or unclean person. This word means what you think it means. Male prostitute is kind of interesting, right? These are people inside the church who are paying to have sex with other men. Sexually immoral. Don't associate, don't koinonia, don't fellowship with these people inside the church. Here's where the love and compassion comes in. There's a righteous standard for God's house. We are not to associate. But what about the people who aren't in the church? Right? Remember, it was almost kind of hit us funny going, I'm not talking about the world. Like, you couldn't hang out with anybody. You could never get to know anybody that way. We couldn't have people who go and do ministry in very highly homosexual areas of town. Why? Because they're not supposed to associate. Let's go to, that was 1 Corinthians 5, 9. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Isn't that good how God put these numbers? Just real close. I know this was other people that did the chapters and verses, but even how God allowed it to work out where it helps me to remember. Oh, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 is about the church in the, in the house. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is out of the house. Are you guys with me? Is this too simple? Okay. I hope that it's clear because I want you to walk away and be able to do these things. I want you to be able to have a conversation with your neighbor that includes these things. I feel like that this is just the right amount for you to be able to take it and take your notes and be an impact around you on these subjects. We are equipping you. That's what we do as pastors. We equip you to go do the work. We are equip I'm equipping you today. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says this, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are deceived, you don't know it. Everybody who I know right now in this world who is deceived, my friends who are deceived right now, they don't know that they're deceived, thus the deception. They think they're doing great. They actually think, my friend who is living in California now, who is the first person that I saw, I'll do your homosexual weddings. Woohoo, come to me. I guess my pastor card still works. Well, A, by that little stupid comment, you're showing me that you know that you're not even, but you're allowing the deception to overwhelm you. You're, you're allowing <laughs> this to be the case. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't let it happen. You know how you don't let it, you're not deceived? You have to love the truth. That's right. Love. I want the whole truth. I want it all. God, I do not want to veer from your truth. 
even if I'm a terrible representative, I still love your truth. I, I'll give me grace to be what your truth is saying. Your standard is so good, I do not want to veer off that one degree because that one degree will separate me from you. Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, huh? Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, uh, lest it's just someone just thinks it's only about homosexuality, right? Obviously, that's what we're focusing on today. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, heterosexual folks, you're in there too, don't worry. Nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. So, lest you think that my explanation earlier for sexually immoral didn't quite cover it. Scripture says, nor homosexual offenders. Neither thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's right. let, let me pose this to you for just a second. What if he allowed those people to be in the kingdom of God? It would be just like the world. We would look exactly like the world. What kind of kingdom is that? Yeah. You're, the, you're the God. You're God. You have your own kingdom, and you let that kind in? It would be insulting. It would be completely insulting. He's like, no, you guys are not going to get in. Here comes the mercy and the grace of God. Even in this list, there's a clear line drawn, and yet we see his mercy. <laughs> and that is what some of you were. Right, row. Hey, by the way, I know who I'm talking to, and this is what some of you were. That's right. You were the swindlers. You were the homosexual offenders. You were the idolaters. But you were washed... You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Draw the line and understand that we have a God that is going to come along and wash. He can wash and sanctify. But they don't need, they're not going to get washed if they don't think that they need to be washed. If we tell them that they're clean, well, I would never do that. But if you're passive and you let this stuff go on around you, and they think that they're okay between them and God, and they're just working through issues, no, you will have nothing to do with the kingdom. There's a line. And we would love for you to step across the line and find the grace and the washing and the sanctification and the justification, but it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Amen. I'm not going to change the line because I really want you over on this side. I'm going to say, you're on the wrong side of the line. I love you. I love you. You're my friend. You're my neighbor. You're my coworker. And you're on the wrong side of the line. Step over here. Well, how do I do that? Well, that's a whole different discussion. Now, now I can have that discussion with you, but if you think that you're righteous because you're a quote-unquote good person, I'm showing you through Scripture, word for word, that you're not, even, you're not even in the kingdom. But I'm a Christian. No, you're not. Oh, that's so judgmental. Uh, I'm just going to read the Scripture, folks. You can think about it what you want. Here is the standard. I'm not allowed to move the standard. You're not allowed to move the standard. This is saying they have no part in the kingdom. God will have nothing to do with them. Now, now is it really loving for me to allow someone to stay in a dying state when I have the ability to do something about it? Love wins. Not like that. You mean show you how love will win? You speak truth. You speak truth every time you come across it. You never back down, even if they're forceful to you. Even if they laugh at you and ridicule you, you stand firm because this is the only way that they can get out of this. This is what some of you were. But you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Amen. Goodness gracious. Talk about getting to some high ground. Man, get, we want to do this. Um, Next slide. <laughs> What's love got to do? You really want to have love win? This is how we do it. We love God's standard enough to refuse to denigrate it in the local assembly. I love God's righteous standard. I love it. I love it with all of my heart. Amen. I love it with all of my being and the parts that I haven't yet figured out is just because I don't even know that they're not aligned yet. So when he shows me, I'm going to get it in alignment because I love his standard. I've got to love God's standard enough to refuse to let 
this become like that? <laughs> Pastor Eric answered it perfectly. Well, what happens if God would allow those people in? Well, it looks like everything else. What happens if we don't hold the standard here? Then we look like everybody else. That's right. There's no point of church if we're not going to hold up a standard. There's no point. Amen. You guys go do something else. It'll save time and money and just go play. Because unless we love people enough to hold this standard, church isn't even worth it. That's right. We love the kingdom enough to represent the truth no matter what the prevailing social winds are. Guys, it's going to get worse. Definitely. <laughs> it's going to get much worse, actually. I sent a video to some of, for some of the teams that I oversee on my job, and I was like, look, it very well might be that in the near future I'll be in jail. Amen. Amen. What an honor. What an honor. And in the natural, that's crazy for me to say that, right? I mean, who wants to go to jail? I'm going to love God's standard enough. If it costs me everything, I'll do it. I'm going to love his kingdom enough that I don't care who comes against me. I'm not even angry when I, I'm, I'm not angry even when I talk to homosexuals. I'm going to love them enough. My perspective, I'm going to love you enough to be so truthful with you. You can hate me. You can punch me in the face. You can slash my tires. And by the end of this conversation, you'll know that there's a righteous standard. Right. You'll know at least which side of the line that you're standing on. I want you on this side. I want you to, but I can't want it for you. You've got to be willing to leave that lifestyle to come and do this. We've got to love people enough to advocate for, to arise and engage in the life-changing power of Christ. Does this sound better when you think about love this way? Yeah. I'm going to actually love them enough to not allow them to die in their sin. How, how have we changed these things so much? And this is what some of you were. You were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord. Next slide. I'm going to give you three areas as I wrap up. Three areas so that you can win arguments. So that you can cause... Uh, allow God's Spirit to get in and change somebody's heart. Okay? Some of you are very good at this. You don't need these. And amen. Just sit there and, and be wonderful. Right? But I want everybody in the room to have some steps that you can do so that you don't get sidetracked and lose and have a lost person win an argument against you. By the way, we're not arguing. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. There's spiritual powers here. But please understand, I want to give you tools so that you can engage people. And if they're pushing hard, you can just push the same amount. Don't give up any ground to the truth. One is topic. Three T words that you can keep in mind. Topic. Stay on topic when you're talking to someone. Don't engage in peripheral arguments. Don't engage in things around. Well, the church is messed up on a lot of things. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this right in front of us. We're talking about the fact that you're a homosexual. Let's stay there. Well, but I've, I've seen all kinds of posts and articles from slavery to segregation to... That's not the topic. Stay on topic when you're doing and when you're talking to someone. You will gain a lot more traction if you don't let somebody weasel out and have an argument that you haven't thought through and then you're like... Right? Stay on topic. Utilize scriptures, not analogies. Amen. Folks, if you don't have enough scripture in you, then work on it. Amen. Then write them down and put it in your wallet. Amen. Then put it on your phone. Yeah. Come on, somebody say amen in the house. Amen. If you use analogies, you know what they're going to do? They're going to use another analogy and theirs may be better than yours. They've probably spent more time thinking about why that homosexuality is okay than maybe you've honed in your argument about why it's not okay. What does the Word say? And the truth is, you'll find out real quick if they are out of the kingdom or if they have a soft enough heart that God may be able to cleanse and justify them. If they're like, well, look, we're going to argue everything else but the Scripture, well, then you know, you know exactly where you are. You're going to plant the seeds that you can, but don't just get off into an analogy land. Well, I mean, if this is the case, then the, stop. Find the Scripture. You're either in the kingdom or you're out of the kingdom. Where are you? Push it back to Scripture. God is the complete definition of love. <laughs> a corrupted version of love does not define God. Don't let... This is what church people do. They'll ignore the Old Testament. I, I said church people. I didn't say real believers, right? 
They'll start, try to ignore the Old Testament. The Old Testament God was harsh, but Jesus was full of love and compassion. Yeah, He was an exact representation of the Father. That's right. So if you think that Old Testament was something, it's the both and of these. You can't ignore... I really like the second story of my house. I think I should just do away with the first floor of my house. Uh, then you don't have a house. It's built upon something. You've got to stay with the complete definition of love. We've talked about it this entire time. Love wins. They're redefining that. So if somebody say love wins, don't go, oh, praise God. Love wins. There was a certain, <laughs> there was a certain president of ours who did a funeral for a pastor the other day. And in the middle of the funeral, or at some point in the funeral, began to sing, began to sing Amazing Grace. Mmm. Woo! Ah! People started getting up and hooping and hollering and Um, um, Mr. President, just because you sing a song about amazing grace, <laughs> I'm not going to let you redefine what the righteous standard of God is for me. The fact, the fact that an ungodly man can preside over a funeral and sing amazing grace and the people there love it Don't let people redefine. I saw articles online and on different places call it, you've probably seen it, Pastor Obama. Yeah. Not making it up. No, 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 no. Don't define that word. You offend me that you use that word. Because that's what I am. That's right. Don't use that word. I'll have respect for my authorities. I will pray for him. And don't use that word with him. Don't allow people to redefine words like love. Don't allow people around you to redefine words like tolerance. It is not tolerance. That is not what we're after. It's too aggressive of a spirit to just say, eh, we just tolerate. No. No. Wrong. So we've got to take a look at the topic. I'm trying to wrap this up. We've got to take a look at the terms. Notice when biblical terms are being redefined. I had a class, I think it was my sophomore year in college. I was 18. Uh, it was a philosophy of religion class. Okay? Worst class I've ever took. <laughs> uh, the professor was a, had his doctorate, his PhD in philosophy and a PhD in religion. Two PhDs. Philosophy and religion, teaching the philosophy of religion class. Here's what God showed me as an 18-year-old, and I'm so thankful for this experience. He would start arguing, and young Christians would stand up and try to defend the faith. He would win the, listen to me, he would win the argument in the first statement. They thought that they were battling back and forth and he had them beat and the Lord showed it to me. And, well, well, this is true, right? And they'd go, well, uh, yeah. Done. The rest of it was only a matter of time until he lopped their head off in front of the entire class. They lost on point number one because they acquiesced and said, Eh, we'll allow you to redefine that. No, it's not that. Actually, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with your basic premise there, and that, therefore your entire argument is moot. Don't allow people to redefine biblical terms. Remember, the Bible is the standard when defining these terms. Well, God is love. Well, what does love look like? Well, we need to have an understanding of what, what love looks like. I want to know what love is, right? While I'm, while I'm doing all these other songs, right? Find a biblical definition and don't let it be something that is not fully seen in the Bible. As if, as a parent, we would love our children enough to allow them to harm themselves. That's stupid. Even human beings know that, much less a holy God. These are words that are getting misinterpreted. Compassion, love, inclusion, tolerance. Forbearance, grace, mercy, faithfulness, marriage. We're just going to redefine it now. They're all accurately displayed in God's character and inaccurately displayed among us. That's why we keep going back to the Scripture and not to each other. Next one. 
So we've got topic, stay on topic. Terms, you define the terms correctly. Don't let them define it because you'll lose your argument. You have the potential of losing the ground that you could gain. And then testimony. Topic, terms, testimony. Give clear testimony of God's Word from the Bible. From beginning to end. The Scriptures that we put on the slide earlier that we had, the Law, the Prophets, the Writings, and New Testament. You know what else you could do? In addition to those things that we should have under our belt, we can talk about how the entirety of God's reaching out to us is typified in a husband and a wife. Our roles and response. You can go so many different directions that are defining it through clear testimony of God's Word. Give clear testimony of God's character from the Bible. <laughs> He's a righteous God. He is a holy God. Show examples. Read 1 Corinthians 5. Read 1 Corinthians 6 to Him. Have something that shows the very testimony of God. Give clear testimony of God's power from the Bible and from your own experience. You know what no one can ever argue with us as believers is about? is the fact that we actually have power behind what we say. We actually have a God who can quicken us and cause us to... And again, I keep saying argument. I hope you understand. I'm not saying that we're only arguing with people. We're trying to advance the kingdom. We're trying to cause the salt to be salty. We're trying to light trying to cause the light to pierce the darkness in these discussions by staying on topic, by us defining the terms correctly, and by us giving a testimony that shows the power of God. As I was thinking about it, it it's really this. (laughs) It comes down to this. If you're in a discussion with somebody, you can come down to a question like this. What is it about God, or His Bible, or His people, that you have such disdain for? What is it that offends you about God? Because clearly, if I'm showing you God's Word and you're doing everything but accept it, why do you have something against God? What is there a disdain in your heart about? You want to turn that on its ear? (laughs) That discussion will then turn on its ear if it hadn't already gotten there. Questions like that. In our our time together this morning, um, God gave Pastor Eric a, a Scripture and a passage that I think fits perfectly together with this. It is in direct confirmation of this. So I'm going to have Pastor Eric come forward. In our time, there are churches working to be emergent. They're working to be relevant. Some churches are standing out because they say they honor dead men in their wishes. Someone in the 16th century set their church's response to today's problems. I want you to know that the Spirit of God will always keep us relevant because the truth is an immutable standard. Tape measures are not subjective. They don't change based on how you cut the board. The tape measure is the tape measure, and the standard of God defines for us what is right and what is wrong. You don't have the right to amend it. The marriage supper of the Lamb is the great Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and hear me, the Bride of Christ. This has been defined since before the creation began. You can find that in the Scripture. The three T's that Pastor Sutherland gave us. They're not to win an argument. I understand the terminology. We're working at how we say this. They're to keep our conversations from failing. They're to keep them on track. Guys, mercy has been redefined to mean that there's no penalty for sin. Say, what's mercy? Well, mercy is that I don't get punished and I should. No, that's not mercy. Mercy. Mercy is that a wicked man can become righteous, that the righteous are not swept away with the wicked. We need to redefine mercy in biblical terms, not today's greasy grace terms. The word that I got this morning came from Judges 5. As I go there, I want to tell you that the part of this message that struck me the most as the three of us prepared it, When he tells you, don't stop, get up on high ground. Eleven tribes 
ganged up on one tribe. But the power of wickedness was so strong in Benjamin in that day that 40,000 people died on the battlefield in two days alone. The cost was high. Four or five times what the Allied forces lost on D-Day. But they didn't stop. Because God's standard was at stake. If his standard is wrong in the house of God, the pillar and foundation of truth, then the world has no hope. If you change the tape measure, if it becomes subjective, how will anyone know where they're at? You are supposed to represent the standard. By the way, while we're on the topic, we're not just talking about homosexuality. Listen to this word, porn. If you have any experiential knowledge with it of any kind, we were talking about you. Listen to this word, idolater. If you love something, even half as much as you love Christ, then you know something of idolatry. Drunkard, swindler. Holiness is the one word that ought to come to mind when you think of God and his people. Guys, there is no victory without cost. Israel paid a terrible cost to fight for what was right. There is no victory without cost. There is only victory at all cost. What are you willing to do for the standard of God? What are you willing to do to take your stand in this day? We can sit on our salvation, cross our arms, Be powder puff Christians and watch the world go to hell in a handbasket. But I think the word today is wake up. Wake up! How dare we contemplate by the campfires during the day of battle? Some of us were these things. That means your very testimony is the key to unlocking their bondage. You say you were born this way. Well, I too was born a sinner. But the living God has set me free. And he'll set you free. You cannot pretend to be in Christ and live like that. We're not going to disguise your bonds for you. We're not going to paint your chains as clerical colors. Instead, we're going to tell you where you're in bondage and tell you, The living God set us free. I got a word this morning from Judges 5. Turn with me to the fifth chapter of Judges. It will be our last scripture today. I was sitting in the parking lot this morning at 5 till 6. I was so engrossed in this that when Pastor Wade knocked on the glass because I was still in my truck, reading the word scared me. Listen to this word. Starts in verse 12. Wake up. Wake up, Deborah. Wake up. Wake up. Break out in song. Arise, Barak. Take captive your captives, O son of Abinoam. Israel was facing its largest battle up to that day. They were outmanned militarily. They were outmanned with equipment. They were outmanned in experience. And the word for the leaders was, wake up. Wake up. This is the time to go get our captives and take them back. Then the men who were left came down to the nobles. The people of the Lord came to me with the mighty. Some came from Ephraim. Somebody say, some came. Whose roots were in Amalek. They had been in Amalek, but now they're coming with the people of Ephraim. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Makir, captains came down. Somebody say, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Isaac was with Barak, rushing after him into the valley. If you lead, someone will follow. Do you hear me? If you declare war, someone will follow you because the Spirit of God will rise up in them. But listen to this part. 
in the districts of Reuben. Reuben was the firstborn. Reuben was the one that should know what the standard is. Reuben was also the first tribe to sexually compromise the standard. And in the district of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the campfires to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the district of Reuben, there was much searching of heart when everyone went to war. The oldest, the strongest, the best equipped stayed home. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan and Dan. Why did he linger by the ships looking for an escape route? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. The people of Zebulun risked their lives, their very lives. So did Naphtali on the heights of the field. Kings came and fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. But they carried off no silver, no plunder. They were not fighting for greed. They were fighting for survival. Verse 20, from the heavens the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The heavenly beings fought, but some of the Israelites stayed home. The river Kishon swept them away. The age-old river, the river Kishon, march on, my soul. Be strong. Then thundered the horse's hooves, galloping, galloping, go his mighty steeds. Curse Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its people bitterly, because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. Listen, I have a word for you no different than Mordecai told Esther. If you stay silent during this time, if you cross your arms and say, well, it's never really been a problem for me or my family, You be careful that the curse of Miraz does not fall upon you because you stayed silent during the time the Lord was at battle. His holy reputation is being assailed in our country. It is now a constitutional right to offend God. It is time to stand up. This week you find your voice. If you don't know how to handle it, if if pastor's instruction was not thorough enough, and it was, Get on your face and find your grounding. If you are sitting by the campfire contemplating during the time of war, who knows but that you may be counted among the enemy. It's not as if we haven't been warned. From Roe v. Wade forward, we've watched this grow, and it is growing at an exponential pace. You think that it won't touch you and the ones that you loved. Immorality unchecked always grows. You can say, well, this person's sweet and they're passive and it only affects their life and it's it's just a personal choice. No, no. Sin always grows. This is going to affect your businesses. It is going to affect your homes. It will definitely affect the weak-willed sisters masquerading as ministers among us. It will close down churches in the sense that they will compromise for it In full-scale fashion, I promise you that. You better learn to stand. Could you stand to your feet?